Our next speaker is Tuukka Takala, a researcher from Aalto University, and he's going to talk about how to stay ahead of the curve in virtual reality. Welcome, Tuukka. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Suvi. And um, so, yeah, I'm Tuukka Takala. I'm a doctoral candidate in Aalto University, and um, I'm also co-founding member and a board member in the Finnish Virtual Reality Association. And um, in this talk, I'm going to briefly go through my, my background and my endeavors in staying ahead of the virtual reality or staying ahead of the curve in virtual reality. I'm going to give you an overview on the consumer VR. Also, I'm going to talk about how developers could make an impact in this field and trying to give you an empowering message. I will also discuss about the near future of consumer VR technology um, and how that can help you in staying ahead of the curve. And lastly, I'll talk about some considerations for VR developers that I think are important. So I have a bit of background with this. I've been uh, working over nine years with virtual reality and augmented reality, starting as a project researcher uh, in Otaniemi Helsinki, University of Helsinki, uh, Helsinki <laughs> University of Technology, and continuing in Aalto. Uh, I am a doctoral student, and I just uh, submitted my thesis to uh, review, so hopefully I will graduate very soon as a PhD. I've been teaching a virtual reality project course for the last five years in Aalto, and I've created quite many applications, mostly just by myself or together with a research assistant. So you uh, don't expect any nice AAA graphics from what I'm going to show you. And I'm just going to quick, quickly go through different projects. This was something I, I did as a, in a student project um, using very simple camera-based tracking to control uh, a virtual character in a dancing performance. This was done using, uh, I think it was Ogre game engine a long time ago. Then, as a project worker in Helsinki University of Technology, I uh, developed some optical tracking and applications for this kind of cave system that were presented in um, science centers and uh, art museums. And this is a very homely finger tracking system that I developed as part of my master thesis. So I have some background with dappling in, in hardware as well, although mostly I'm, I'm focused in software. And here is, this is from 2010, where I, this was before we had access to PlayStation Move controllers. So basically what I had to do is, is I had to develop my own version of the PlayStation Move controller using V modes and uh, LEDs. And this, this is just an example application that we did a user study and uh, published a paper on this. It actually, the, this system worked quite well. I mean, obviously it wasn't as accurate as the, let's say, lighthouse tracking system, but pretty similar in, in features. And um, yeah. More recently, I've been working in Unity, developing my own uh, virtual reality toolkit together with uh, research assistants. Uh, the toolkit's name is Ruiz. 
this video is from a very, this is one of the first videos of the toolkit in use. So basically we developed this toolkit for our students and hobbyists of virtual reality. So they would have a tool that they could use to easily develop virtual reality programs. And what you see here are these VR avatars controlled by Kinect tracking combined with uh, PlayStation Move controllers that uh, track these items that these guys are holding here. So this was just our simple playground demo that we used just to kind of demonstrate different what can be done, for example, with this kind of combined tracking system. And since then we have developed this, uh, the Ruiz Toolkit further. The most recent version has support for head-mounted displays and Razer Hydra and so forth. This was something I, I did for Blender, uh, a custom 3D user interface. And in uh, this kind of semi-immersive and affordable setup that uses a 3D TV, uh, PlayStation Move controllers, there's like head tracking, then there's like uh, these uh, controllers that you can use to manipulate objects and you know basic blender stuff. Also, you can draw some meta balls and some other stuff that I kind of I implemented using the features that are available in Blender. So yeah, let's jump ahead. So the, this is a very basic like example, like what could be done in a kind of virtual 3D modeling environment. And this was done in fairly, fairly quickly, uh, this user interface. I think it was maybe less than three weeks or something like that. Here's an example of like box modeling using the PlayStation Move controller. It was... Yeah, it, it works surprisingly well. I mean, not really production quality, but as an experiment, it, it was fine. Let's see if there's anything else here. Yeah, you could also use the 2D interface of Blender uh, using the PlayStation Move. And then I also have this Texture painting, let's jump back a bit. While you're moving the viewpoint. Okay, so I was doing all this stuff and I was going to conferences with other virtual reality researchers. And this was all exciting. I mean, we felt like we have some, this is, going, this is the future. But we were all kind of waiting and, and seeing like, okay, when is this thing going to become mainstream? And there were a lot of people kind of working on this and, and despite their best efforts, uh, it didn't seem like we were getting there. It didn't seem like we were getting near the consumer VR. So there was a bit, bit of frustration and I guess apathy in the field. And, and Sony at the time was making head-mounted displays that they used for displaying movies and, and they had such a big latency that they were completely unusable for virtual reality. So that, that was the situation then. And just to give you an idea of, of the atmosphere, um, I'll, I'll tell you an anecdotal story. The first time I met Palmer Lucky was in 2012 spring when he was still working in University of Southern California as a lab technician. And uh, at, at the same time, he was working on his own vir virtual reality headset prototype that would become the Oculus Rift. And on that spring, he left the, left the job as a technician and he told his colleagues that I'm going to go start a company on virtual reality. And I heard later from the colleagues that they were kind of like laughing about it, like, okay, company in virtual reality, I'm good luck with that. It didn't seem like economically very reasonable. But um, 
lo and behold, just like in the next August, uh, became the Oculus Rift Kickstarter, and it was a huge success. And I think also Palmer's like former colleagues also changed their attitude after that, especially when their uh, Oculus was bought by Facebook for two billion, like in less than two years. So, and this, the Oculus Rift Kickstarter really kind of is the starting point for the virtual reality hype and, and kind of starting point for the consumer VR that kind of changed the whole landscape and atmosphere. So right now, I mean, we have uh, these very optimistic projections of how the whole VR, consumer VR hardware and software business will grow. And there's a lot of uh, new investments, more and more, like every year, uh, both in VR and AR. Uh, and I, I just want to remind developers that because there is so much hype, obviously it will help you, you know, because people, investors are aware of this technology and they're aware of the hype, but you should only also know that because there are so big expectations, there are also going to be disappointments. So um, let's see what happens with, for example, with the Oculus Rift and HTC Vive games, how, how good retention they will have if people will keep coming back. I'm a little skeptical right now because most of the games that you have in VR are, are mostly like demos and kind of very experimental things. So I, I don't know if we have really reached the, um, how, how do you say, the kind of core value or what's, what VR is really about. So just be aware that there, there could be some kind of uh, public uh, backslash for all these hype. And luckily we had some other major players join the race. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the HTC Vive and um, also PlayStation VR that is uh, going to be released later this year. So right now the situation is that we have three major players. Uh, I also got to mention the OSVR, which is uh, as an open source initiative. I, I need to support that even though they are small. Uh, all of the three major um, systems are using these kind of VAND controllers that are tracking six degrees of freedom. Then there's also the mobile VR, like the Samsung Gear VR and the Google Daydream uh, platform. And because there's so much hype, there's also all these other gadgets coming out, all kind of Kickstarter projects there. Kind of they're trying to, hoping to replicate the Oculus Rift success. And I uh, personally, I think like the creating new hardware for VR is, is really challenging to become successful that way. Um, mostly if, if you have a, some really cool or nice technological innovation and, and you can patent it, then maybe, but otherwise, good luck with this. And uh, I also have to say that I'm very skeptical on many of these devices, like the omnidirectional treadmills. I don't think that that will ever be uh, widely spread things or that many people will have them at their home. And also, also these small cap suits I, I have my own uh, reservations about this. I am more hopeful about the software side of VR. And uh, this is the kind of empowering part of the talk that when I, I'm trying to give you a hopeful message that right now is a good time to work with VR. And I'll tell you why. Uh, first, anyone can become a virtual reality pioneer because this high-performance VR hardware is available for consumers, which means basically democratization. Like earlier, these devices cost a lot of money and um, they were mostly available for researchers or some big corporations. Now, every, every little kid, at least with a middle-class background who can afford it, can buy these devices. 
And I put a picture of um, Steven Spielberg here because he started with his father's like home video camera as a child and teenager. So that, that was his kind of film school. And, um, and he ended up affecting Hollywood in major way. He, I mean, he was the guy who kind of invented the summer blockbusters, blockbuster movies. So I think even now, like, there could be some little kid that has just gotten their virtual reality headset, um, and he could be the next Steven Spielberg of virtual reality. And I think it's quite possible. And the second uh, assertion that I want to make is that individual and small teams can make a big impact in VR. And, and the reason for this is that, that consumer VR is, is pretty much uncharted territory. There are killer applications that are waiting to be discovered. And the big corporations they don't really know either, like what, what, what is going to sell, what is going to be the next big thing. So you could, for example, come up with an application that is the Minecraft of VR, just as an example. So there, there's, there is advantage on working this, on this kind of uncharted territory. Also, virtual reality is a new media. And existing media kind of needs to be reinvented in VR. And somebody has to be that person who develops new conventions and best practice for, um, well, let's say, VR games right now. That is probably the field that is furthest right now. There's a lot of experimental VR games going around. And they are making a little money. I mean, they're not a huge success right now, but it's a growing field. Then there is uh, virtual reality cinematography. There's one company in the US kind of working on kind of finding the language of VR cinema and other fields like immersive journalism. Then there's virtual reality social media. Facebook is working on that. There are many smaller companies that are kind of, kind of trying to come up with the Facebook of VR. Then VR education has a lot of potential. I think you, one example is think of surgeon simulator, but more realistic. And then there's, of course, VR commerce. Now, I'm not saying that all of these fields will come or they will have a VR kind of uh, coming in the near future or that it will be easy, for example, to transform journalism in uh, virtual reality. No, it probably will be hard and it will probably take some time, but eventually it will happen. Now, as a developer, um, you have to be really aware of the hardware that you are developing for because that really determines the limits of the interaction. And I have come up with this simple categorization of, of kind of different VR um, platforms or areas depending on, depending on how um, immersive or extensive the systems are. So at the lightest end, there's this mobile VR, then this is kind of medium immersive uh, VR room systems, and then there are these VR attractions. I will quickly go through each of them to, just to demonstrate what I mean. So the mobile VR is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, self-contained headsets with inside-out tracking, Probably in the near future, you will also have some kind of hand controls combined with the mobile VR headset. And this is also, um, this is very much related to augmented reality. I mean, mobile VR and, and also augmented reality are very, very close to each other. Um, and eventually, augmented reality will be a bigger market than VR, just because it will replace smartphones, but that could easily take five to ten years. 
Let's wait for the magic leap that will be released later this year, so then I can say like a better estimate if it's going to be closer to five years or closer to 10 years for this big AR breakthrough. Uh, this medium, the virtual reality rooms, and what I mean with this is are basically spaces like uh, room size, normal room spaces that have some kind of motion tracking systems like Oculus Constellation, the Valve Lighthouse, PlayStation Camera. And these setups will be at people's homes to some extent, but even more so in, in PC cafes, especially in countries like China and South Korea and so forth, where these kind of PC cafes are very popular and people don't necessarily have the room or, or the money to buy these kind of VR mm, systems. And then finally there are these big VR attraction things that are in amusement parks and so forth. There are already a couple of uh, existing examples like the Void, Zero Latency, V Arcade, and I guess the best analogy for this is, is the laser tag, or I think it's Megazone in Finland. Now, I'm going to quickly go through some of the near future technological developments that, as, as a VR developer, you should probably be aware of. So, we will have light field displays. Uh, which will allow you to focus your, you know, naturally your eye to focus at different distances. There's going to be foveated rendering, eye tracking. Uh, slowly, there are going to be better ergonomy, uh, smaller, you know, smaller and lighter headsets, and eventually there's going to be wireless connection that you won't trip on the wires on your at your home. But these are all kind of um, improvements that a developer doesn't really need to worry about unless they are working really close to the hardware. So this is stuff that most developers can just take as granted and not worry about. Um, one big area in, in VR that is kind of, it's not there yet, it's, it's haptic feedback uh, and the sense of touch. Unfortunately, the sense of touch is a really, really important uh, human sense and the fact that it's so lacking in hardware support it is, is a big minus. So right now we have motion controllers with actuators and this kind of rumble feedback and that situation is going to stay for quite, quite some time. Um, then there are different ways of providing vibrotactile feedback, like sense of vibration, like these kind of gloves that there are already companies that are kind of selling vibrotactile gloves. And then there's this ultrasound emitter arrays that can remotely send you these sensations. But unfortunately, these systems can convey a very limited, um, uh, limited sensations, so limited range of sensations. So it's not going to give you force feedback. And, and what we are really lacking is something that will push back when you're putting your hand on a virtual object. So it doesn't go through the object, instead it pushes back. Now, and that's something that is really far off. You basically need some exoskeleton or some crazy matrix like uh, direct brain interface to achieve that. And such, such things are really far in the future. So meanwhile, we, we really have to make do with this kind of compromise solutions. Now, the biggest thing in near future that's going to affect you as a VR developer is, is going to be the evolution of the input device technology. And so what we have right now are these WAND controllers, and uh, they are not going to go away. They are going to stay here. There are various reasons why they are going to stay here, but it's mostly related to you know, having buttons, like having robust 
buttons that give you tactile feedback and so forth. Even when we have like uh, this kind of finger tacking, like a leap motion system that works nearly perfectly, even in that case, uh, these wand controllers, are, they're not going to go away. Instead, uh, what I believe is that we will have both of them. We will have finger tracking. It might come, it come embedded in certain, um, like it might be that Oculus comes up with in the second or third generation of their consumer version that has embedded finger tracking. And, and then it, depending on application, you, you decide if you use your finger, just your fingers or if you use a, a controller. So another thing, we are, we are, and we are not also going to be tracking fingers, we are going to be tracking the full body of the user, like kind of like what you have seen with Kinect. And we are going to have depth sensors that are going to, in real time, going to get the uh, 3D scan of your body. And this will be mainly for um, telepresence stuff, also for scanning at the home environment. And how I personally see this will work is that you already have in the Wild Lighthouse, you have those two base stations. Similarly, when you get the Oculus Touch, you will have the, the, the two Oculus cameras. Now, in the future versions, those sensors will be also have uh, a depth camera with them. So, and th the depth cameras will, will be used for body tracking and also this uh, 3D reconstruction stuff. And, and there are certain reasons why I, I strongly believe that this is the case. Like, first of all, this is like purely optical tracking. You don't need to wear any kind of suit to track your whole body. I have very hard time imagining that Oculus or Valve or HTC would require their users to wear some kind of mocap suit for just for games and so forth. Now, I'm not totally dissing on mocap suits, um, that the perception neuron and so forth. I think they will have limited use maybe in independent game developers who need uh, like cheap mocap solutions. Okay, so here's an example of markerless mocap. This is from a company called Capturey. They are, this tracking is already better than you, what you can do with Kinect 2. Now, this system uses eight color cameras, so obviously that's too many for home use. But just, I believe with two Kinect cameras, uh, some proper sensor fusion, you can achieve really good solutions. And that, I think, will be the future in virtual reality in these home systems. My own research has also been very much um, uh, involved this kind of full body tracking using the Kinect. And this is a uh, quite early demo using the Oculus Rift DK1 just after we received uh, it as a Kickstarter backup. This was in summer 2013. So in, in this demo, we are using Kinect 1 to track the body. We are using uh, Oculus Rift for the first person view. And also we are using either um, PlayStation Move or Razer Hydra for he head tracking and this kind of um, VANT controller system. So this was really ambitious project to kind of combine all these consumer devices into one whole that would give fairly immersive results at an uh, affordable price. And I'm actually quite happy how it turned out. This was also the first publicly available demo that combined Kinect and DK1. And in this video, I'm just demonstrating the different, uh, different features of the demo, like how you can use this kind of traditional uh, controller-based movement that probably most of you will know that will cause some like uh, cyber sickness. 
Also, I'm using the, the wand controllers to grab and interact with objects and, you know, do all kind of stuff. One is like a selection and manipulation controller. So, yeah. So this, this was also um, made with the Ruiz toolkit uh, that I talked about earlier. So, but yeah, I, I, I'm a strong uh, believer in, in the feature of what you can do with, with full body tracking. Let's go upstairs. Here's another demo. Um, this is a later one. This used Kinect 2 and Oculus Rift DK2. Later we uh, ported this to HTC Vive, so right now it's also working on Vive. And just the fact that you have your full body in the virtual reality, even though the Kinect tracking is kind of, it's jerky and it's not always perfect. There's a lot of faucets. It's still better than just having your head and these controllers. That is my experience. And I'm, later I'm going to try to set up this demo in the VR zone around 4 o'clock if everything goes well. The head All right. Is augmented. And another video demonstrating um, the importance of facial tracking as well. This is, is another area in the future that I think will happen. Uh, here they are using um, cameras to track the lower part, the mouth, and stress sensors to track the eye areas. So obviously it's a problem because the head, headset is kind of occluding your eyes and, and but the, these guys came up with a way to also track, track your eyebrows and, and so forth. This kind of technology is important for social VR purposes. Okay, now to the last part of the demo or, or the presentation, I will give you some considerations uh, to any of you who are VR developers. First, you need to justify why your application uses virtual reality. Things don't get magically better just by taking them into virtual reality. I have a, like a straw man example here. It, it's like word processing in VR. Why would you do that when you can just use a laptop? I mean, there might be some strange reason, uh, but it's really hard to imagine, like, why would anyone want to do word processing for other reason than having, like, 10 different windows in there or something. Now, it's easier to imagine, like, uh, the justification for doing 3D modeling in VR. Like, first off, you have more depth cues, you get the stereo effect, and you, you get much more spatial understanding on what you're uh, modeling or animating. So, for certain kind of tasks uh, in 3D modeling, I think virtual reality will be uh, better. It's just that it hasn't really shown yet. But uh, Oculus and, and Google, they have all these kind of 3D art tools right now where people are at least having fun with the technology. And by the way, this, is, this also goes for game developers, right? So why, why should your game be in VR? I'm, I'm perfectly happy playing like Super Mario Galaxy on TV. I don't necessarily feel like this would be so much better in VR. No, I would probably get motion sick after a few hours of that. Um, so you, uh, people should really think some special aspect on why they're re using VR in their applications. Secondly, um, virtual reality, I think social aspects are really important for VR and, and this really has a lot of potential I think there are quite a number of people who rather spend their days by themselves or in online chats. They are maybe not comfortable in public. And, and for those people, I think virtual reality provides a perfect way. They can use avatars, they can kind of hide their true self, or they can be 
whoever they like in these virtual worlds. Uh, that's one aspect. Then there is uh, the aspect of um, telepresence actually remotely being present. And, and uh, this is something like I think Facebook is, is like really wanting to do. That this is their big dreams for VR, that they will connect people or you know, bring people together even more than they are doing right now. So how this works is that, that there's going to be all kind of these avatar uh, experiences with cartoon characters. Then there's going to be these more realistic 3D scanning telepresence applications. But even in those, you can modify your real self as much as you like. Also for a game developer, even if you're developing a single player mode, you should think about allowing spectator modes that people can join in and watch someone play your game. And then there's all kind of these waiting rooms and virtual reality playgrounds and other, and then the, the ulti ultimate like metaverse or the massive uh, online game. That, that, that is one of the possibilities. Okay, this video is an is, uh, early Oculus Touch video that will just demonstrate two people interacting each other uh, in virtual reality uh, through an online connection. So there, this is a very much a sandbox example. They're just having fun there, playing around. And only thing that distract are their hands and their head. So it's a very short video, but you can you can already get the idea that there are there's all kind of like body language here and and gestures that they are doing that this has a lot of potential. Now the final point is um, I'll try to explain it, but it's it, augmented virtuality is is a concept that where you augment you alter the virtual reality with elements from the real world, okay? So you should think as an application developer, if your application requires the full attention of the user, or if it also allows other activities while they are inside the application. Now the problem in virtual reality headsets is that they take your whole field of vision, they take the whole attention. And this is not necessarily what people want. And, and HTC Vive, has, they have been pretty clever about this because they put the camera on the headset so you can turn on the, the augmented uh, virtuality mode and you can see your, uh, the keyboard and you can, you, know, you can see where the keys are or you can grab your drink. Uh, that, that wouldn't be really possible. If you hadn't had the camera, well, you would have to peek under the headset and that, that gets annoying real fast. So that's one way to do it. But fortunately, virtual reality offers more possibilities than just augmenting with real world. You can also augment with anything. Now, this is an example of a virtual desktop um, system called the Envelope VR. And basically, what the, their current demo has that you can bring all these web browser tabs and, you know, actual search and, and these folder menus into the virtual reality. And I guess, yeah, okay, there's a point there. But uh, instead of having kind of uh, Windows VR, maybe there's a use case for that, probably. I would like you to think a little bit further, like bring really arbitrary streams in your uh, application. This is a mock-up image, a concept image uh, using the Pool Nation VR. And um, so there are like people, it's a, it's a single player, multiplayer, you're playing a pool. But you know, while you're playing, you might get bored waiting for your turn. So let's say that you, you might want to see some TV while you're waiting. So in the background, you could have Netflix or something playing uh, that uh, episode of Office that you missed. Or you, might, you might have a, like a virtual window with Reddit or something there. So this is what I mean is that, let's say you have a game. 
and there's a lot of like grinding or some boring you know stuff going on and because people are playing it in virtual reality they might get bored real fast so why not allow the users to bring their own content inside that experience so of, of course this is not going to work with some very immersive game that's trying to affect your feelings but in certain kind of more casual games and applications this will work so really something for you guys to consider okay that wraps it up pretty much uh, any questions there's a question there Uh, what VR glasses would you recommend buying now for just working with, say, Blender so that you could use your keyboard, you could see your keys maybe at the same time? Um, well, for Blender, I, I know that they are working on VR interface. Uh, they have some stereo rendering stuff. But I'm not sure how, if it's ready yet, so I, I'm, I'm not willing to give any advice because that might be wrong. What about Unity? The only, only um, software with a working VR interface right now, I think, is Unreal Engine. Unity is still working on theirs. Now, I, I also want to like, make a point that working in VR is not necessarily more efficient. So that's something that is being explored right now. Any other questions? There's someone there. So, um, I heard that, uh, especially 3D modeling with field, the engineering is really big thing for the VR. The main issue is right now that the scaling about the things that you're designing. Maybe you don't have exact design criteria and you want to feel around how large your dimensions are really for the item that you're doing. And uh, if you want to 3D print it, it's going to take time and you need a printer or supplier or whatever. So if the VR gets good enough, then you don't even need all the tracking stuff exactly. You only need the headset and a proper scaling for the things that you're viewing at the distance. So you can feel around how your thing is in real life before manufacturing even a prototype. Is, is there a question there? Yeah, my main question is that you mentioned 3D modeling. Yeah. Have you heard about you know, the engineering aspects of it yet? Have you gone through that? Uh, engineering aspects of 3D modeling. Uh, well, can you be more specific? Mainly like uh, you know, 3D modeling in games, characters and stuff, the scale isn't that important. Have you considered how you can, is there a field about the, how the scaling of what you see and the distances? You okay. know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, uh, this is something that has been said in many VR guides that uh, compared to uh, all, like desktop games, like in virtual reality, you have more depth cues, so you can sense the scale better. So if the scale of the object is wrong, you, you will sense it. So for virtual reality, if you're a graphics artist, you should get the scale right. And it's probably a good idea to before you, you kind of ship your 3D model, you test it in virtual reality first. Is that what you're going for? Does that answer your question? Yes, that is qu quite correct. Sorry, I forgot that you can't see me here. <laughs> OK, cool. Any more questions? Yeah, here we have. Hi. Do you see mixed reality like Le Magic Leap coming up? Do you see it as a threat or as a, a new promise or combining augmented reality and virtual reality? Basically, mixed reality is both. 
Yeah, um, yeah, the, the terminology, mixed reality, augmented reality, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, um, uh, well, uh, magically, for me, it's, it's a great development, it's, it's a great promise to me, I don't see it as a, as a threat in any way. Uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, they're all very close to each other, or I could say the mixed reality is kind of superset of, of uh, augmented reality. But anyway, they're so close that uh, I don't really even see this kind of like somehow they would be opposing each other. No, because they both, all of them use 3D user interfaces, very similar kind of interfaces. So whether you are working on VR or on AR, you can easily kind of jump between these areas. So I don't see how any of these competing products or competing technologies, VR, would be kind of away from the other, each other. But like I said earlier, like right now VR is a little bigger because there aren't any good AR devices. Magic Leap is coming and eventually AR is going to be bigger for sure. But VR is not going to vanish. Hi. Hi. Uh, so for me, the motion sickness and the very limited space for consumer class product seems like a major roadblock. So do you see any ways around those problems in near future? Yeah, that, that, that is a good question. Uh, well, first, the motion sickness. I mean, the biggest problem right now is basically the locomotion moving around. If there's acceleration in the game that you don't experience in real life, that ca causes most of the cyber sickness. Right now, the high-end um, high headsets don't cause too much, um, too much motion sickness by themselves. And in the future, it will get even better. So the problem is mostly about locomotion. And many developers are right now kind of innovating the field of locomotion. Is it going to be like traditional, you push forward, the character walks forward? Uh, or is it going to be teleportation or something else? Yeah, it's, it's compromises. I don't know. Let's see what people will find out. Uh, second question is, is about like the play area. Of course, people have different sizes, living rooms. They have different setups. And yeah. That's another problem. Some games uh, are kind of adaptive, that the games change depending on what the room size is. And uh, yeah, there's no easy solution to that. To that. I think the PC caf uh, cafes that are popular in some countries could come up with some kind of standard minimum size. But yeah, but the fact is that you're never going to have a, like a home set up that people will have that has this huge. So people just have to come up with some really clever uh, locomotion systems. OK, I think that's going to be our last questions. But I think you can catch Tuukka at the VR booth later if you want to ask some questions. So thank you, Tuukka.